Welcome to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. We got an awesome topic lined up for today. I'll dive into that in a second. But first, what is Harmonious? Why are we here? Harmonious is the disruptive way that you need to look at your business. It's the 10 fundamental business disciplines that you need to know as a small business owner or entrepreneur to take your business to that next level, calm the chaos and the firefighting, streamline your business, and grow it to where you want it to be. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the three-legged stool, the mind-body business stool, and I think we're going to overlap in mind, body, and business. So very interesting topic today, and we have a serial entrepreneur with us. So first and foremost, let's welcome to the show, Justin. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brandon. Appreciate being here. Yeah, so let's. I'm going to put this on the screen real quick. This is the, the, the topic of today, four things you have and must use to become the best at anything I'm, I was intrigued when I saw this. I'm excited to dive in, but give me, before we dive in, give me a little bit of your history. Um, how did you kind of get to this point in your career? Cause you have an interesting backstory. Well, not going back too far. Uh, I trained wild Mustang horses as a trade. And then I, uh, utilized those in a trail ride business and Colorado Rocky mountains. So after, investing a lot of time doing that, I realized very quickly these wild horses are significant in the fact that they can teach us more about ourselves than anything else I've ever found. And it's, and it's real. It's like real time, uh, real effect, real application. So I'm, I'm into seeking the truth and horses don't lie. So whenever we would present something to them, you know, they're going to give us the truth. So 13 years in the mountains of Colorado, acquired many horses to do that business that I, that I created. Um, the significant things that I started seeing, I wanted to apply them uh, in a much more meaningful or impactful way. So we did a camp for children with cancer for six years. And then I got to witness what the horses could do there, uh, the healing effect, the powerful you know, impacts they'd have on, on children. Then we did a, um, a little at-risk program for, for children that were at risk for suicide. And then I, I got to watch, I got to be a witness and watch what those horses could do for, for those children. And then we, uh, we kind of evolved into where we're at today. I uh, started another business, which is the American Mustang School. And our mission is to promote mental health and wellness through the preservation of the American Mustang horse. And um, I mainly am a, a life coach, uh, for, for lack of better words, kind of distilling down what we do. And uh, I teach, you know, mental health and wellness through the practice of horsemanship. So wild horses, you know, they're born out in the wild. They're uninterrupted by man. So kind of like a wild flower, you know, it's a wild horse. Uh, they develop life skills in nature that a domestic horse wouldn't really have to develop. So the crossovers with a wild horse that, uh, you know, has developed those skills because the strongest law of nature is self-preservation. So a wild horse wanting to do that develops, you know, skills to do that and is acutely aware of their surroundings. They don't miss a beat. And uh, whenever we present ourselves to them, they're, they're, they're aware and they tell the truth. And if we're not connected in mind and body, you know, thought and action, they, uh, they're they there to, to call us on it. So the crossovers with, you know, special operating forces is what I cater to today. Um, those guys operate in a high functioning mindset, action. Uh, when, when that disconnection starts to happen within them, um, it's not good. That's not a good thing. Their, their job is at jeopardy. So interacting with a wild horse can bring back that mind body connection so they can function at a uh, very efficient and effective uh, way. And, uh, you know, peak performance is what those guys are at. And, you know, I, I cater to the top 300 elites in the military. So they, they definitely have to perform at peak levels. So wild horses, were the uh, answer to a question that a lot of people haven't even begun to ask because science and psychology hasn't even caught up to what we're getting to see and do here at American Mustang School. 
Yeah, that's, you know, that's such a cool backstory. And obviously your clientele is, they're dealing with life and death. These are, these are things you have to master and be able to manage on the fly, on the spot. Like you don't have room for error in that situation, which is not what most people have to deal with, thankfully. But I love that, that you notice this in, in working with wild horses, what they're able to bring out and teach us. And that's so cool. So the, the four things that we all have within us, can you, can you walk me through that framework real quick? And, and for the audience, basically how that shows up for us as business leaders, as entrepreneurs. Absolutely. So when developing my school and some of the curriculum and programs, I, uh, I had learned all these things for myself long ago and I was applying them in, in practice. And whenever I teach it to someone else, I had to develop a way to explain it. So in my own experience, I would have to present myself to the wild horse and then uh, watch feedback. And then I would have to make corrective changes, present again and watch feedback. Well, I developed a feedback loop and the four things that I discovered within myself that I had to be aware of and then I had to definitely be in control of was thoughts and emotion, attitude and action. And I'll go through each one. Thoughts and emotion, they are the internal pathway of communication with any living being, you know, especially a horse. They share the same things we do. Uh, thoughts and emotions. So the internal pathway, whatever they're doing in action is a reflection of those thoughts and emotions. So the attitude and action piece is the external. So I can see their attitude and I can see their actions, vice versa. They can see mine. So if I'm not aware of my thoughts and then I'm not aware of what those emotions are based on those thoughts, my attitude, if I'm not aware of, the horse will be my actions definitely so i learned that if i'm gonna go and try to ask a once wild horse or a wild horse before they're once wild to come into the human element i had to align thoughts emotions attitude action within myself present the best version of myself to the horse and then ask them to come into the human element you know and i want them to be willing in that so you know, being a good leader to a wild Mustang horse, I, I have to care more about the one I'm leading than being the leader. Uh, in, in, in other words, I want to create a willingness in this horse to want to be part of my team because of what I present to them and who I'm becoming and doing that. So whenever those horses would see that there is a benefit to doing this. They will step up and do things I cannot train them to do. They will train other horses in ways I can't, and they will adapt to people in ways I cannot train them to do. And I can give you some examples of that if you want, but the, the, the reason that it worked was because when I was in control of my thoughts and emotions, attitude and action, I could present the most efficient and effective way of leadership because horses, they do not pick a leader based on anything other than how much that leader cares about them. They have to have a benefit to follow that leader. That leader is generally going to be the, one of the most vulnerable horses or willing to be vulnerable. You know, they'll step into the roaring river to get to the other side to get to the best grass. So then the other horses see that and they're like, wow, he, he was vulnerable, put himself in a vulnerable position for us. We'll follow him. And then there's a willingness there that, you know, compounds, it has a compounding effect. And if we present that, observe feedback from the horse, make changes, present again, we can shape and mold the relationship any which way we want it to go. And then we become better, the horse becomes better. And then it's, it's more like a, an observer guide relationship at that point. Because there's things that horse can do I can't train them to do. And then there's there's things that horse doesn't understand in the human element. They depend on me. So we've we've cr I've created a relationship where I empower the horse to have a voice, even though it's nonverbal communication. You know, whatever their actions are is a reflection of what they're thinking. Whatever their actions are is a reflection of their emotion. You know, 
if their attitude, once I start to develop a relationship, I can tell what their attitude is. I can tell what their actions are. And then I'll, that'll give me information to realize what their thoughts and emotions are. So, and vice versa. You know, I, these, like I said, these wild horses are acutely aware of their surroundings. So when I would go walking out to a horse and start to develop this relationship, I might have a lot on my mind. You know, my mind is scattered thoughts or, or thinking in, in the past or maybe anticipating the future. I wasn't in this moment. I wasn't in the now, so to speak. So the horses would respond in a manner, sometimes subtle, sometimes obvious, to give me an indication like, hey, you're not here. Where are you? And you're not thinking. And then I would have to, you know, basically stop and self-analyze myself, you know, and say, well, yeah, you're right. I'm not thinking in this moment. My emotion was a little frustrated because I was thinking about something else, you know, maybe trying to get something else done in a hurry. And then the attitude and the action followed. So the horse would respond in a way that was undesirable. Well, when I got those four things in alignment, the horse would always respond in a desirable way. And it's, and it's a corrective feedback loop that I initiate, but once it's circular and not intermittent, it flows. I don't have to force it. I don't have to take it. And it works that way with people too. But with the horses, it's where we practice. So I wrote a book about this and um, published this year. And, and it's, it's one of those things after I wrote the book, I read a bunch of self-help books and I realized, wow, everything in a self-help book I've, I've learned through the practice of horsemanship and creating a team to help me go and do what we do today, which I have nine horses and they help me help others. And uh, it's a very versatile team. So all walks of life can come here. And these horses will adapt to them. You know, horses can adapt to a thousand people, but it's difficult for a person to, to adapt to a thousand different horses. And it's like that people to people too. Some people can adapt to a thousand different people and that's going to give them an edge or a power, a superpower and over someone who's not able to do that. So I just want to pause real quick and say two very important things. One, if you think we're talking about horses today, you've completely missed the mark. And two, Justin just gave you a master class in leadership that like that, that four minutes was more on leadership than most people teach in seminars that cost $10,000 to attend. So let me, let me highlight one of the most important things you said, tie it to the harmonious architecture. Remember the I in harmonious is inspire. So before we get there, Justin said, as a good leader, you have to care more about the one you are leading than being the leader. That is the definition of inspiration. You cannot inspire somebody if you don't care about them. So that's go listen to that last four minutes again. That was game changing for anyone who needs to elevate their leadership skills. And of course, the mind and body connection is was very present throughout your entire conversation there. Now, I want to dive into this book because um, it, it sounds like this is going to help a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs. I know it's selling like crazy already, which and you've won some awards. Congratulations for that. I, I want you to tell us about all of it. Um, but what are some of the things that, that we can learn from this book and apply to being a better business owner, a better leader uh, for our teams? Okay. Well, one of the most significant things about the book that's probably not in any other horse book are understanding laws of nature. Uh, whenever I would interact with a wild horse, I'm in their element. So that's nature. And it's a nature based, you know, therapeutic activity. So I did it because I love doing it. And, it, and it's kind of one of those things that could really be a hobby or or I would do it for free or whatever you want to call it. But as I started to, to realize the significance uh, that these horses had on humans, I needed to have a way to explain it to people. So laws of nature, we'll just give an example. Whenever I would get a wild horse that's never been touched, I've got to understand laws of nature in order to abide by the same laws they abide in. So We'll just use law of energy conservation. Uh, I talk about this in the book. It's very important. 
horses, wild horses, you know, they are not going to exhaust unnecessary emotional energy or physical energy. It would uh, deteriorate their ability for, you know, long-term sustainability and survivability. Uh, if they were worrying about things for no reason, that would exhaust them mentally and then, you know, in turn physically. Because restrictions in the mind of a horse and human create tensions in the body and prolonged restrictions in the mind. And, and those can be doubt, uh, confusion, fear, anxiety. Those are restrictions in the mind and they cause tension in the body of a Mustang, of a horse and people. So those laws of nature, energy conservation, you know, they, the horse is not going to run around and exert unnecessary energy because when he needs it at the most you know, important time, he wouldn't have it. I learned this because I would take people into the high country for seven days at a time. And we call them a pack trip or outfitting trip. <clears throat> the Mustangs, they're very smart. So we'd get going and, you know, they may be a little fresh and they're, they're pulling good and we're going up the mountain. And, you know, about a quarter of a mile in, they start going a little bit slower and, and then they just get into a good gear and then they just can go all day. And then the next day, same thing. The third day, the same thing. Um, that's the that's them abiding in the law of energy conservation. They're they're not going to use more energy than what's necessary to be effective and efficient at accomplishing whatever task I ask them to do. Uh, I know this because I train a lot of horses, and I bring in a domestic horse, and they'll they'll be kind of dancing around and exerting a lot of unnecessary energy, and then kind of calling out to their friends, and you know just not really getting serious yet, and then. About the day and a half in, they're like, oh, this is serious. I've got to use my energy wisely. So I talk about that in the book. And then, you know, like law of compensation, you know, uh, to train a wild horse, I'm not going to expect to put a saddle on that horse day one. You know, there's a law of compensation says it takes time, the time it takes. You know, I want to progress without forcing this horse to submit with pain or fear. Force compliance does not work. If I'm going to train up a gem of a horse, I want it to take the time it takes. So law of compensation, it's a lot like this. You might have heard this in another example, but you take a seed and you plant it in the earth. It takes the time it takes for that to germinate and grow. You can't go bury it and three days later come out and like, hey, where's my fruit? You know, I want it now. It doesn't work that way. So these laws of under, understanding these laws of nature will help a person succeed when others that don't even know the laws exist will, will you know, I'll say fail, but definitely, definitely be temporarily defeated. Because I just don't think and I don't think in lines of failure. I, I've I've built my own houses, built three houses from the ground up. We've, we've uh, created companies and, and sold them. Uh, so I, I just, I've never failed at anything. I, I've temporarily been defeated and thought, man, I got to find a way to, to get this done or to do this and look at it at a different perspective. But, you know, when you, when you strap yourself to a wild horse, you know, there, there's just, there always comes a time where you're like, well, I'm strapped to this wild Mustang horse. I, there's not, I'm not going to give up. <laughs> We're going to have to get this done. Uh, I've got to ask this horse to help me carry clients around the mountains or carry children that are recovering from cancer or now, you know, U S military soldiers and, and do it efficiently and effectively. So in the book, I talk about how to create those things to reduce friction or to reduce defeat. Uh, it's it's succeed because all it is is you got those four things and you can control them. You can apply them to anything. And then, of course, in the book, I'll talk about three other things that they need. And that's a purpose, a flexible plan, and then take action. Uh, and that's a pretty common understanding among a lot of these self-help books I've read since I wrote my book. But <laughs> I, I would go out and I would have a purpose for this horse, mainly a major purpose, which would be today. But, you know, five, six, seven years ago when I got him off the range, 
I'd have to have a minor purpose. Like, well, day one, I've got to get to touch this wild horse. And then day five, I've got to put a saddle on them. And, you know, day 10, let's go riding. And then I've got to show them the, uh, the process. And, and then understanding those laws of nature, I would abide in them. So I would never break or detour that horse's willingness. Yeah, this is, this is amazing. And again, if you think we're not talking about business and we're not talking about people and leadership and your employees, you're a little bit lost and just go back to the beginning and listen again. <laughs> That's what I'll say about that. These lessons are universal and they're so important. Um, we got to wrap up this episode. I've tied it to the harmonious architecture. This is, this is a much deeper conversation that I would love to go more in depth with Justin on. Um, his website is here on the screen, AmericanMustangSchool.com. Definitely go grab a copy of that book so you can hear, um, you can just dive in and learn more, apply this to your life and get all of his secrets about how you can apply this to your life, your business, your leadership, your team. It sounds amazing. I got to grab myself a copy. This was, this was a great episode. Justin, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I really appreciate you coming. Yeah, I appreciate being here. So we're going to we're going to wrap this one up. This has been another great episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Um, Justin, I don't know if you host leadership retreats, but if you don't, I'm going to go convince Justin now for the next three minutes that he has to because this is mind blowing stuff. And I absolutely love this conversation for you listening. Give us your feedback. Put it in the comments, like and subscribe. Ask your questions. I'll get them over to Justin. I'll make sure he answers them. And we will get your questions answered, how you can apply this to your life and your leadership to take your business to the next level this year and beyond. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next episode of Harmonious at Lunch.